Well, hey, thanks for tuning in. You know, this is where we get to come together online during this season. You know, the response has been amazing. Last week, we had over 500 people throughout the world watch our services. So it's incredible how God is using this. And if you know someone who could benefit from hearing this message about the hope of Jesus, then share it with them. Just think of it, if all 500 people shared this, then we'd have a thousand views. You know, Easter really is a time in our culture where people are seeking a church. And now more than ever, people are receptive to joining a church service online. And if someone has shared this with you, then hey, we wanna say thanks for checking us out. And you can find out more info about who we are at St. Mark PHX. And while you're there, we have a digital welcome card that we encourage you to fill out. We also have sermon notes that you can download and you can even make your own notes on. And we can also give electronically there too. Today is Palm Sunday and this is a big Sunday where we get to say Hosanna which means God saves us. And we declare that Jesus is our King. So from your homes or wherever you may be, may you find worship to be meaningful as you shout praises of Hosanna. Thanks again for joining us.
We begin our time this morning in the name of our God. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Let us at this time spend just a few moments confessing our sins to God. The mercy of our almighty God, Jesus Christ, was given to die for us. And for his sake, he now forgives us for all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. So may the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, the Father, who sent your Son to take our nature upon him and to suffer death on the cross, that all mankind should follow the example of this great humility. Mercifully grant that we may both follow the example of our Savior Jesus Christ in his patience and also have our portion in his resurrection. Father, we pray this this morning knowing that you hear us through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you at this time to confess with me the words of our common faith and the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary 
and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits now at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The New Testament reading for this Sunday comes to us from the book of Romans, chapter 15. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Here ends the reading. The gospel for today comes to us from the Gospel of St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had before with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of this world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know it as truth, the truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. And I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost, except for the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, And the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. And I do not ask them to, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. So sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. And you sent me into the world so that I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I am in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them and you in me, and they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you have sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. 
Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundations of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. And this is the word of our Lord. Savior of the world and 
substitute for our sins, more loving, more holy, and more wonderfully terrifying than we ever thought possible. He is our Jesus, and there is no other king like him. He is our God, our glory, our victorious Savior. There is no other king like him. There is no other king. Today we're continuing on in this sermon series that we began last week. Um, I'm getting ready for Easter. And I know it's a little different getting ready for Easter than maybe normal, but I, I think today's message especially will, will give you some encouragement and some things to hope on in the days ahead. So first of all, I just want to ask a question. When you picture freedom in your mind, what do you think of? Maybe it's the American flag that you think of or the Berlin Wall falling down. Maybe it's seeing soldiers at attention or the Constitution. Maybe it's the 4th of July or maybe it's Martin Luther King. or Maybe even it's Hiroshima. Or maybe for you it's something entirely different altogether. Maybe you picture more the blessings of freedom like unrestricted movement. Remember when we had that just a couple weeks ago? <laughs> or, or freedom to be whatever that you want to be. Or voting in your conscience in the poll booth. Or, or having the religious freedom to worship in truth. See, all these things would be incredible pictures of what the word freedom can bring. But I think I have one that's even better than all the things that I mentioned so far. One that's even more powerful a picture of freedom than any of those that we've talked about. And that's this. The greatest moment of human history and the greatest freedom that's ever been won for us was won for us on the cross at Calvary by Jesus Christ some 2,000 years ago. And it's that amazing freedom that the Bible talks about in Ephesians 1-7, where Paul writes these words. Through his blood, we gain our freedom, the very forgiveness of our sins. And so next week, we're going to be taking a look, and we're going to actually be celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ went to the cross and gave his life to pay the price for our sins so that he could give us eternal freedom. Freedom to be with him forever in paradise, freedom from our sins, and that's truly an incredible moment in human history. But maybe you're still wondering in the midst of all that's going on, or maybe you're just checking in for the first time and you're new to Christianity, but maybe you're just thinking, why the cross? I mean, why is that a picture of freedom? Why is that a symbol of Christianity all around the world today? It's kind of an interesting question, and it's interesting because Jesus actually tells us the answer to that. On the night before he died, on the night before he went to that cross, Jesus prayed a prayer in which he talked about all the reasons he was going to do what he was about to do. In other words, he was telling us why he was going to the cross. And in that prayer, he talked to God about the way he lived his life. And he talked to God about his love for his disciples. And he talked to God about the reason, right? The reason he was going to the cross. It's all found in John 17. And so as we look at this chapter, we see that in verse 1, it just says this. Jesus looked toward heaven and he prayed. And if you're reading through the text, you see that he goes on to pray for the next entire rest of the chapter. But to be honest, as I've been studying this chapter again this week, I can't think of a better way to get ready for Easter and by taking a look at this prayer that Jesus prayed. Because it's in this prayer that you see two very powerful things happening. First, I think you see a little bit of Jesus' heart here, right? You can see his passion. You can see what's really important to him. And you can see why he was about to do what he was going to do. But not only do you see his heart in this prayer, but I, I believe also you see our hope. Because in this prayer, you see the things that we can actually hope for in this life. Because as Jesus prays this prayer, he doesn't ask God for things that God won't do. Sometimes I think you and I do that, right? We pray for the lottery. Help me with the lottery, God, but we never do. I think sometimes we don't know how to pray all the time. But that's not true of Jesus. He always knows. Everything that Jesus prays, you can have confidence that this is something that God is willing to do, is able to do in your lives. And so in this prayer that he prays, he testifies to our hope in this life and in the next. And here's the cool thing. When he prayed this prayer, he was praying for us. In John 17, 20, it says, Jesus says, I am praying not only for these disciples right here, but also for all who will ever believe in me because of this testimony. 
So when you look at this prayer, when you see what's really important to him, you begin to realize exactly what he wants to do in our life, and it helps you understand why the cross. So what does Jesus pray? Jesus prays first and foremost, God, give them protection. I think that's one of the things that Jesus prays for us, that God would give us protection. In John 17, 15, he says this, I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, but to keep them safe from the evil one. Now, I know it's April now, and traditionally April 15th has been a big day. It's just coming around the corner. So I think maybe it's important just to clarify at this point that the evil one talked about here in this passage, it's not the IRS. That's not what Jesus is talking about at all, right? The evil one is Satan. I know for some of you, you get a little confused on that. You think the IRS and Satan are the same thing. That's, again, not what Jesus means. He's talking about keeping them safe from Satan's power in this world, from the way that he wants to mess up your life, from the way he wants to bring pain into your life, from the way he wants to take people down. Jesus prays, don't take them out of this world, but keep them safe from Satan while they're in this world. So notice that Jesus does not pray that God would build a bubble around our lives where we don't face any of the troubles that are, that are in our world. But instead he says, while you're in this world, you're going to face troubles. Whether it's health troubles or financial troubles or circumstantial troubles or whatever, and I think we're facing all of them now as we're going through this coronavirus thing. You're going to face troubles. And you're going to deal with the fact that there's just some uncomfortable circumstances in this world. And that's what it means to live in this world. And so if you think that being a Christian means that you're not going to face any of the struggles in this world, you, you miss the point entirely because even Jesus faced struggles in this world. And so Jesus prays, Father, don't take them out of the world. Don't build a bubble around their lives. But while they're in this world, help them to be safe from what Satan wants to do in their lives, from how he wants to mess up their lives. Forgive, renew, and strengthen them so that they might not give in to his lies I think this is so important because when Satan comes and he will and tries to destroy your life, we have a choice. We always do. We can either turn away from God or we can, and we can get bitter and we can I don't know, let our hearts grow cold and so much of the world does it or we can run towards God because remember that Jesus is praying, God, protect them from the evil one. He's praying that in the realities of life that we could turn to God, that our hearts would warm to him, that we'd be finally in a place where we'd realize that he has hope and an eternity in heaven that's just waiting for us. So while we deal with this reality that nothing is perfect in this world, except maybe for God's love for us and his grace, we comfort ourselves with the truth that he is preparing us for an eternity with him. So Jesus prays. Protect them from the evil one. Jesus is praying for our protection. And I tell you, I, I, I can't overemphasize this point right now. I, I think when we go through all this stuff that the coronavirus has brought in our way, the, the worries now about finances, the worries about the future, the worries about our health, all the different things that are coming our, our direction, we can get so caught up in the circumstances of life, get so fearful over the things that are happening that we can forget that God is right there with us by our sides. We can forget that Jesus is praying for our protection. We can forget that he loves us, that he's able, that he cares, that he sees. It's so important that we know how much God loves us. And as we see him praying, we see first and foremost him praying for our protection. In John 17, he also prays, God, give them unity. I love the word unity. It's supposed to be one of the marks of the church, one of the things that the church is known by, that people are so passionate about Jesus that they just love each other and they just get along. Sometimes the church doesn't always do a good job of modeling that, but that's one of the things that Jesus prays for us. God, give them unity. Jesus prays for us to have relationships that are marked by this unity. Now, as he prays, you're going to notice that he sets the bar extremely high on this. Listen to how he prays in John 17, verse 21. My prayer for all of them is that they will be of one heart and mind, just as you and I are, Father. Did you hear that? Jesus says, the kind of relationship, God, I have with you, I'd like them to have that kind of unity with one another. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear stuff like that, it does something to me. Because the minute I hear and I start thinking about all that, I realize I can't do it. How can I be unified with another person like Jesus is unified with the Father? And if you're thinking that way, I think we're thinking exactly like Jesus wants us to think. 
We're realizing that I can't do it all on my own, that I don't have the strength to love another person the way that God can love another person through me. And so if we're going to love in this kind of way, if we're going to have this kind of unity, the only way we can have it is to lean on the strength and the love of Jesus Christ. Because that's where it comes from. Only God can work that kind of love in us. And as he does, he also promises this. It's something that the world around us will notice too. People will look at us and say, they have a kind of love that you can't find anywhere else. They they have a kind of love that you can only find from God's strength. How do they do that on their own? And I think that's exactly what Jesus wants to happen. Just a, a few minutes before he prayed this prayer, look at what he says to his disciples in John 13, verse 35. This is how everyone will recognize that you are my disciples. When they see the love that you have for each other. Love that verse. Jesus says, here's how people are going to see that you're my follower, that you're my disciple, not by looking at how big a Bible that you have, right? And not by looking about how many fish that you have on the back of your car, not by how the cross that you hang around your neck. But Jesus says, they're going to know it. They're going to know you're my followers by how you love each other. And that's what helps people see that this is real. This relationship with God is real and not fake. But how do you do that? Because the problem with loving people in this way is that, you know, we're dealing with people. And sometimes they're irritating and sometimes they're hard to get along with and and sometimes they just wear you out. How do you find strength to love in this kind of way? Romans 15, 5, Paul tells us, he says, May God, who gives endurance and encouragement, give you a strength of unity among yourselves as you follow Jesus Christ. I want you to notice the last three words of that. Follow Jesus Christ. Because ultimately, that's the secret to this whole unity thing. That's what actually creates unity is when we follow him together. For example, if you can get a group of seven-year-olds to play follow the leader, even for five minutes, for those five minutes, they're united, aren't they? They're doing all the same thing at all the same time because they're following the one leader. When we follow Jesus Christ together, that same kind of unity happens for us too Because again, we're all following the one leader in Jesus. And in those moments, whether it's the kids playing follow the leader or it's us following Christ, in those moments, all the barriers to unity are forgotten and they're erased. Because there's something bigger that brings us together during those times. And that's why Easter is so important. Because it's at the cross that he removed those barriers once and for all. It's at the cross that our forgiveness was won and our reconciliation with God was cemented. It's at the cross where we're reminded again and again that there is something bigger to this life. And that's what Jesus is praying here. He's praying that we would come to love each other and be unified together in Jesus Christ. And then Jesus prays, give them joy. In John 17, 13, he says, I'm coming to you now, but I pray these things while I'm still in the world so that the followers, my followers, these followers can have all of my joy in them. When you first read that, maybe it doesn't really connect with you. I don't know. Because I, I don't know if everyone thinks of Jesus as a joyful person. But he was incredibly joyful as you go through scriptures. I think sometimes the reason for this is all those movies and TV shows about Jesus that we've seen over the years, he just sort of wanders around like a zombie, but that's not him. As you go to the scriptures, right, it shares what Jesus is like. Jesus was incredibly joyful in this life. Where Jesus was, people wanted to be. If Jesus was in a crowd, the crowd got bigger. If Jesus was in a house, the, the, the house was overflowing with people. When he went to a party, everyone went to that party. Where Jesus was, joy was. So people flocked to be with Jesus. He was magnetic. And so when Jesus prays this prayer, he's saying, that's the kind of joy I want to be in my followers. And so Father, would you give that joy to everyone that follows me? That's awesome, right? But what exactly does that joy look like? In John 16, verse 20 through 21, Jesus said, you will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. And then he gives us a picture of that. He says, A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child has been born into this world. Now, that is a picture of labor. I have to admit, I don't have a lot of personal experience with this, none whatsoever. But what I do have experience with is being in the delivery room 
for the birth of all three of my kids. And I've seen what happens. And I have to say, as an observer, it doesn't look very comfortable. And there's obviously a great number of painful moments as you're going through the process. But the other thing that I've witnessed during this time is that the moment that baby is born, I mean, each time my wife has given birth, that pain has turned into joy. And when that baby is born, the first thing my wife has said to her newborn daughter has been this. Well, it's not been, well, why did you do this to me, right? But every time she's given birth, Bess cried, where's my baby? Immediate joy. And Jesus says, that's the way it works. We don't live in a world where there's no grief, no pain, no problems. But Jesus does say, I want to take the grief that you're experiencing, the difficulty you're experiencing, and turn it into joy. He says, that's what I can do for you, he says. And that's exactly what he was going to be doing for his disciples. They're going to see Jesus die on that cross. They're going to be filled with grief and they were going to be mourning. But just a few days later, they're going to see a resurrection. He was going to take their grief and once more turn it into joy, turn it into something awesome. You know, as we're going through this coronavirus place, I I think, again, we can get so caught up in the circumstances that we can lose our joy. We can lose seeing the positives. We can lose ourselves. And, And that's where Satan messes with us more than anything. Or we can turn back to God and remember his promises. And again, recapture our joy, recapture life. And that's what God calls us to do. And that's what he's praying for in this prayer. And then finally, he's praying this, God, give them a mission. Give them something to do. Would you give them a mission in this world, God? John says in John 17, 18, Jesus says, in the same way that you have gave me a mission in this world, I give them a mission in this world. That's what he wants in every one of our lives. He tells us in just a few verses later is exactly what the result of this mission he wants to give us is. In John 17, verse 23, it says, then the world will know that you sent me and that you love them just as much as you love me. So here's the mission. Jesus says, I want you to go out into the world and I want you to let people know that I was sent into this world so that people would know how much I love them. It's the Christmas message, isn't it? Six times in this prayer, Jesus prays, I want the world to know that I was sent by God. Why is this so important to Jesus? Why does he pray this prayer so often? Because he knows us. And he knows how easy it is for us to go through our lives ignoring the fact that Jesus was sent into this world by God that God himself came into this world in human flesh, lived his life for us, died on the cross for us, was resurrected for us. And he knows that we could go through the next 60, 70, 80, 90 years ignoring that fact, ignoring his presence, ignoring his love. But Jesus also knows this. He knows that if he can get us to stop just for a second, just for a moment, just long enough to realize that God sent Jesus into this world, He knows that if he can get us to stop to see that truth, that we'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves us, that God loves me. God's not setting up in heaven right now ignoring us. He's not angry at us, but God loves us. He loves me enough to come to this earth to die on the cross all for me. And Jesus wants the world to know that same thing. So how do you know that God loves you? You look to the cross Think of the humility it took for God himself to come down to this earth and to die on that cross for us. God, who shoulders the weight of the universe, was willing to come to this earth and put a cross on his shoulder to stumble underneath that weight. God, who can hold all the stars in his hand, was willing to come to this earth and was willing to sweat drops like blood and face the reality of the cross. Why? Because he loves you. More than any of us will ever imagine, he loves you. So next week as we celebrate Easter, we celebrate the cross and the empty tomb. We celebrate the evidence of God's love, the reality of our newfound forgiveness, the proof that he's actually there and that he cares. You see this prayer, the protection, the unity, the joy, the mission, the forgiveness of sins. That's why God sent Jesus into the world. Guys, as you prepare for Holy Week, I I invite you to tune in Thursday as we celebrate Monday Thursday and Good Friday as we celebrate Good Friday. But I pray, especially this week, that you would re-remember how much God loves you, that you would be comforted by his troubles, even in the midst of the stresses of life, and that you would celebrate 
the love of God that sent us Jesus. Guys, go with that peace today and serve your Lord always with joy. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. God, we love you so much. And as we go through this very weird time in our country, we pray, first and foremost, I guess, Lord, we pray for for health, that you keep us healthy in the midst of the storm, that you allow the things that the government has tried and trying to kind of stave off that sickness from so many people. I pray that you be with the doctors and the researchers to, to get vaccines and shots and all sorts of things that may help the care of this disease so that more and more people don't have to die, so that more and more people can get healthy quicker. But Father, I also pray for the anxieties that we're struggling with, the stresses that we're overwhelmed with, the the financial crunches, the the worries about family. And I pray that somehow, some way, you can get our focus off of all the circumstances and back onto you. For in you we find our comfort and our peace and our strength and our hope. Let's go with that peace today. And we serve our Lord always with joy. And all God's people said, Amen.
Father God, as we prepare for Easter this next week, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We know what things looked like for him this week, 2,000 plus years ago, as he made his way to the cross. And we're so thankful to the, for the sacrifice that he made for us so that we can be cleansed from our sins, so that we can be given new beginnings, so that we can be given new and fresh starts, so that we can be with him forever in heaven. But we are also so thankful for the support that he offers us in our lives today. He is our advocate and he prays for us. We are so thankful for the prayers that he lifts up for us, prayers of protection and unity and joy. And Father God, we're also thankful for the prayers for our mission. As you're called children, we know that you've got a purpose for us in our lives. We know that you've got us in your hands and are protecting us. We know that you love us without end and that your promise is to keep working things for our good. And so we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his coming. We thank you for the forgiveness. We thank you for heaven. And we thank you that you walk with us as we go through this life. And Father, we pray all these things knowing that you hear us in the name of Jesus. And so we pray the prayer he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. everybody, I just wanted to say thanks again for checking us out today. We so hope that God was able to use the service today to share with you again how much he loves you, how much he cares about you, how he walks with you during these uncertain times, and that he's always right by your side. I also pray that you remember that he works all things for the good of those who love him, and that even now he's working in the midst of the storm. If that's the case, we pray that you would consider sharing this video with somebody that you love that, that needs to hear these same words of encouragement and hope. And we also encourage you during this time to subscribe to our YouTube channel and, and like us on Facebook, you know, so that you don't miss a thing that God has in store for you. And finally, if you're in a place where you're able, we hope that you consider making a donation to the ministry of St. Mark. Doing this allows you again and again to continue to say, God, I want to keep you first in this area of my life, including in this area of finances. 
but it also helps ensure that we can continue to share the good news and the promises of our faithful God again and again and again. Guys, thanks again for joining us today and, and have an absolutely awesome day. We miss you so much.